This week's episode of Creepscast is sponsored by Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash Mr. Creeps to get your free life insurance quote and see how much you could save. And to Omaha Steaks. Visit omahasteaks.com and enter Mr. Creeps into the search bar and order these spring and grow pack today. You'll save over 50% plus you'll get four Omaha Steak burgers and four boneless chicken breasts free with your order. Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well today. We have a great episode for you, with many horror stories guaranteed to really make you chill. Let's begin and drift further into Mr. Creep's mind. I work for the devil on his behalf, as a clerk. Written by MWMN19 Well, how can I explain my current situation? The simplest way to put it is that I work for the devil. Not in the way that you would imagine, though. I'm not going to remote places with a black hood to sacrifice kids and animals to the almighty Lucifer. That would actually be a marginally better job, save for how blatant it is. I would rather draw pentagrams than do what I do now. I work as a clerk, or you could say a receptionist receptionist or a judge or all the above. I think that this is my punishment after I died and you'd be right, but it was also from necessity on the boss part. For most of human history, the boss, aka the devil, did most of the paperwork and judging, since there were not as many humans. He would hire some part-timers to help him if there was a major plague or a war, but for the most part, he was the sole person to decide your fate to which part of hell that you would go for the punishment for your crimes and the time sentence. Yes, there is a time sentence for most crimes, though they work slightly different than in the mortal plane. The highest one is simply being labeled as infinity, and you can have a guess who is reserved to that sentence. But I digress. Ever since humanity managed to prosper and multiply at a great speed, and the massive wars and plagues that ravaged mankind throughout the last two to three centuries, the boss needed some permanent employees to do the judging for him. And even if there are thousands of us, if not more, there is still a long waiting list. Mankind became such a headache that even the devil himself can't do all the work. Same goes even for God, from what I've heard. As for myself, how and why did I get to the position in which I currently am in? The answer for the how was rather simple. I died, and I didn't have a saintly life. As to why, I was a judge to be somewhere in the middle of the spectrum of morals. I never did anything really bad. I never killed anyone nor physically hurt anyone. I never stole anything, nor am I an adulterer. But on the flip side, I was never really generous, nor was I a friendly type. I rarely showed affection or sympathy, having the mentality of, it's your problem, not mine. I'm not a psychopath or a sociopath. If I see someone suffering, I would feel bad. But I would oftentimes rationalize that fact to myself as, that's life, and it's their own fault. Or I shouldn't pry into someone else's life. That on its own wasn't the only reason that I was selected. I worked as a bank receptionist in my past life. I would put up a fake smile and help people ruin their lives with massive loans that they would regret soon after. As well as see those same people break down as they find out the government is taking their house and car. Informing people that they are going to a world of suffering for hundreds, thousands, millions, or even billions of years with the occasional forever. It has similar results. Now, to get to the job itself. The way that I got it was that a clerk, as myself now, went through my file and deemed me adequate for the position of clerk, since there was a spike in demand. My contract is permanent, unless mankind's numbers decrease significantly, or we go extinct, which we will eventually, probably. After almost five years of experience, I think that I got an idea of what the job entails. I am by far not the most experienced. There are people with over a century of work experience, 
but those guys are new to the internet, so they won't write. We are allowed to use the net to gauge how much traffic there's going to be, like if there are any wars, diseases, etc. And the boss really loves to browse the human web for entertainment, to see how we react from the torment that he causes, and that we cause ourselves. And now that I have some free time, I decided to write this. Is it allowed? Absolutely not. Did I find a loophole to exploit, thus making me immune from the wrath of the devil himself for the time being? Absolutely. But it comes with its own risk. The devil is in the type that will always follow the rules. As I mentioned, he does browse the net. So there is a small chance that this will go under his nose. But also a chance that he finds this. And he won't give a crap about the fine print when he sees what I've written. And God knows what he'll do if he does find this. Now, for the work itself. Working in hell, you would imagine be surrounded by fire and brimstone and screaming souls of the deceased. But that isn't the case. I am located in the middle ground, or purgatory. There are three levels, better said, megacities, that are responsible for judgment. The first level is entry. They're the souls of the recently deceased are screened for sins and virtues, the good and the bad. It's a relatively quick process, taking up to three months on average. After you've been screened, you are sent to one of the two other megacities, to us in Hell Incorporated, or to Heaven Incorporated, where you'll be further assessed to which part of Heaven or Hell you'll be designated. And that's my job. I wake up in the morning, and yes, we need to sleep, eat, drink, and crap like you. Why? Because we aren't truly dead, and we still have to do our mortal needs. If we don't, we won't die per se, but it won't be pleasant. Anyways, after I wake up in my apartment in one of the many city blocks where the employees and those who are waiting to be judged reside, I do my morning routine and prepare for the 18-hour shaft. I don't have to commute, thanks to the devil. I only need to exit my apartment in a specific time, and I'll teleport to my workplace instantly. And when I come to my desk, I prepare my paperwork, see who has priority and who has been put lower on the list. I open up shop and I start calling out names. After the person comes and sits down, I opened up their file, analyze their doings in broad terms, and I start questioning them. During the questioning, I need to ascertain the responsibility for certain crimes. For example, if we have a murderer, did he or she kill the other because of hatred, a passion, self-defense, revenge, accident, or among many other things? In other words, we need to find out if it was intentional or unintentional. There's a lot of questioning and rummaging through paperwork for that, and it can take a few hours with each client. Other crimes might include theft, if that's the case, I have to find out if the person stole the thing because of greed, necessity, or accident. Now, people do steal things on accident. You might have taken someone's phone thinking that it was yours. So, in short, with the example of theft, you have subcategories which state the broad reason, and then there are categories under those which ascertain the object's worth and to which category it belongs to. In other words, it's a necklace, a vehicle, a TV, or whatever. Under that, we have the object's worth to the individual being robbed and its effects on that person, as well as the way in which it was stolen, was it an armed robbery or not, etc. And kleptomaniacs and serial killers are a nightmare to judge, because we have to catalog every object is stolen and person murdered, from cookies stolen when they're four years old to the killing sprees. The longest case I had was for a kleptomaniac and a hoarder who killed his mother because she had placed his action figure at the wrong place. It took me the entire freaking shift to judge that guy, and I had to have a poker face the whole way through, and in the end, answer any questions that he might have. Now that we've done all of this, sir, before you go to the sixth level, do you have any questions which you would deem important? Um, are there any, like, um, cat girls or horned girls there? Horn, uh, no. There are none to my knowledge, is there anything else? Um, is there internet? No, there's no internet connection for the duration of your stay, which is, I might repeat, 
32,486 years. Now please stand up and take that elevator over there so I don't call in security. That, that is not an extreme case. It's annoying, but it's nothing compared to some uh, special cases. I had a guy who thought he was doing the will of God by turning a bulldozer into a tank and ramming everyone who wronged him over, destroying millions of property. By some miracle, he didn't kill anyone. He pleaded insanity, but I had to explain to him that there is no plea of insanity in hell. Though, there is a category which investigates whether or not the person had any mental health problems or had a corrupted soul. All of that is needed to be confirmed. In the end, he ended up having quite a light sentence when you add up the points. He didn't kill anyone. All the damage he did was legitimately done in the name of revenge against those who had legitimately wronged him. He ended up with 200 years in the second level. Not good, not bad. What happens if I do something wrong? Well, to be fair, I don't know. But from the stories that I've heard, the souls of those who slight the boss are thrown deep into the gutter. Those who deems and no longer fit or unessential are thrown to the wayside. Either judged fairly as most of the clients we handle or just to disappear one day, simply without a trace. That is if they really messed up. Some of you also might be thinking that these sentencing might be unfair sometimes. Well, it probably is, but I don't make the rules. I just follow them. Why does it take so long and why is the process so convoluted and inefficient? The devil and by extension God can instantly judge one person at a time. Yes, the being that created the universe and is basically omniscient and omnipresent can only judge one person at a time. I don't know why, but it's like that, I guess. In short, they knew human employees don't have the same ability as them, that being mostly absolute authority. So they made a list of rules and regulations to make sure that no one is unaccounted for and that all judgments are fair. Now, of course, sometimes I think that the judgments aren't harsh enough for some individuals, and sometimes I think the judgments are too harsh for some people. I had a case that I really think wasn't fair toward the person in question. A man came to my desk and he led an average life. He had a bout with drugs in his teenage years and wasn't the healthiest of people, and the way that he died was by his own hand. The guy was a father whose children were taken away from him after a divorce due to his propensity for violence and alcoholism. He was unable to see his children for 20 years, and in that time he had completely reformed his life. He had stopped drinking and smoking completely. He never missed a day when paying child support, and with the little money he did have, he sent presents to his kids every Christmas and for their birthdays. He sent them letters often and he lived for his kids. He gave up every luxury in life so that he could afford that one present when Christmas came. After 20 years of this, he finally contacted his son and daughter and they told him that he was a monster and that he wasn't actually their father. They spat on everything that he was and ever will be. They accused him of never sending gifts or letters to them and that he didn't care. In the end, it was his wife that simply threw away the letters and played off some of his gifts as a gift from herself. Soon after, he took his own life. His sentence, according to the point system that we use, 2,745 years in the fourth level. I understood why he wasn't a good father. He wasn't a good husband, but he had tried. But alas, there are no second chances in hell, only suffering. I know that I describe myself as uncaring, but for the briefest of moments, I felt sorry for that man, as he cried in pain. He didn't care for the sentence. The rejection that he felt in life despite all of his work to fix everything was punishment enough, at least in my humble opinion. But I have a job that I have to do, and after he went into that elevator, I recomposed myself and uttered the second name to come forward. In the little time that I have to sleep in my apartment, looking out the window toward the perpetual moonless night outside, lit up only by a few red streetlights, I think about the countless lives that I had sentenced up to this day, how many scum I saw and how many forsaken souls I witnessed. I never was a believer in God and I would go as far to say that I was an atheist. 
But in the end, what you believe in was irrelevant. The deeds you did and the consequence that it had on others around you is the most important thing. What you left behind determines your sentence and your punishment. Or at least, that is what conclusion I've come to in these five years. And in those perpetual nights, I asked myself what will happen to me. I might work here for a long, long time, but it won't be forever. Every soul must be judged eventually. I was never given a proper sentence, so I don't really know. Even if I am familiar with the process, I can't determine my sentence. I can have a guess, but I'm never sure. The job in and of itself is torture. 18 hours interviewing all sorts of people. Even in death, insomnia is still a big problem. And to be fair, I'll never know if I did anything wrong until it's too late. The life in those cities is tough, even if it's purgatory. It is the devil's part of the purgatory. The food is scarce and hard to come by, sometimes even for us employees. If you wander the streets at any time, there's a risk that you'll be attacked by the starving people. They would either steal any food that you have or try to consume you. You cannot die here. You will regenerate any flesh or limbs that you lost. Some people have been waiting here for so long that they went completely insane. I'm immune from the threats from the outside mostly. The food comes to my door most of the time. Sometimes it doesn't. But during the night, I can still hear the footsteps from the hallway. In the five years that I've worked here, there were multiple break-ins. People cannibalized one of my neighbors. The guy is alive and well now, but isn't the same ever since. He was an employee as myself, but he was simply fired because of his mental state after the tragedy that he went through. Now he awaits his fate, and he can only hope his sentence is marginally better than the devil's purgatory. I have dozens of other stories of the various people that I saw and judged, of the things I heard and witnessed outside on the cold red streets. Some of them interesting and some of them not so much. But I have little time left to write this. I have to go back to work soon enough. Free time is a luxury in these parts. As to you, dear reader, there is a chance we might one day cross paths. One day you might sit in front of my desk and I would ask the question I always ask first. So, tell me about yourself. Tell me of your sins. I would like to thank this week's sponsor, Policy Genius. Policy Genius is a marketplace working to help insurance shoppers understand their options, compare quotes, and buy a policy all in one convenient place. I was talking to my friend about how confusing insurance can be one day when he brought up Policy Genius, a platform that makes the entire process a whole lot easier. Once I learned how simple it was to get started and to secure myself a life insurance policy, the more it made sense that I should get started now. It provides me with a lot of peace of mind and typically, life insurance only gets more expensive as you get older, so I thought getting a policy now seemed like the right choice for me. Policy Genius made the whole process a breeze. It's your one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance that you need. They make it easy. Just click on the link in the description or head to policygenius.com slash mrcreeps and answer a few questions. In minutes, you can compare personalized quotes from top companies to find your lowest price. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. The team of licensed experts at Policy Genius will help you understand your options and apply for the policy that you choose. Their team works for you, not the insurance companies. You can trust them to offer unbiased help and advocate for you at every step until you're covered. Head to policygenius.com slash mrcreeps to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. Thank you once again to Policy Genius for sponsoring today's video. I found some home videos from my childhood in my parents' attic. Written by Mrs. Stakes. My father, who I loved so much, recently passed. It was hard on both me and my mother. Really hard. 
He was 75 when he had passed away, and my mother is now 70, so she's too old to go through all these things herself. She's also disabled, hasn't been able to walk since the age of 62. So, as the only child and really only contact with the world, I decided to take it upon myself. It was a big task, sure, but I thought maybe going through his things would be one last way to bond with him. I began sorting through dusty boxes, figuring out what should be kept, what should be thrown out, and what should be donated. It's pretty cool to see all the vintage, antique things from decades past that my parents had kept with them throughout the years. As I moved things around, I came across an old trunk with a lock on it. This isn't surprising because my parents have always been somewhat secretive. So I grab and inspect the lock. It's old and rusted. I bet with a good whack of a hammer it would come right off. I could have taken the time to hunt for a key, but God knows Dad would hide something like that in a place where no one would ever find it. And plus, truthfully, I wasn't in the mood for a scavenger hunt. I dig around and find my dad's old tool set and grab the heaviest hammer that I have and I bust the old lock off. I sift through the contents of the trunk, videotapes, a baby book, some old clothes that my mother probably wore in the 80s, and some other things that didn't really catch my eye. I was very interested in the VHS tapes. I pick a tape up and read the label. Evan's birthday, 88. I smiled and chuckled to myself. I remember they always had that old video camera out. He always said that he loved to relive his best moments over and over. I decide to take a few of the tapes to the TV in my dad's office at just below. I'm glad that he never listened to me when I told him to toss out that old VHS player. I pop the black tape into the player and turn my focus to the distorted video, slowly sorting itself out on the screen. There I am, just two years old, splashing in a little puddle at a park in my tiny blue rain boots. My mother is holding my hand and laughing, and you can hear my father say, Big jump, every time I splash in the puddle. My mother lovingly tussles my dark brown hair. Just a serene moment of time captured on this tape like a firefly in a mason jar. I smile to myself, remembering my dad and hearing his voice. It didn't sound how it did before he passed away. Less raspy and more energy. But nonetheless, that's dad's alright. I sit and smile at the screen. And I'm then snatched out of the moment when I see something that doesn't fit quite right. Off in the distance of the park, about 100 yards away, maybe a little bit less, out by the tree line, there's a woman facing away from the camera, just standing still all by herself. Her long black hair clings to her emaciated form, and her skin looks pale, at least from what I can make out. It seems like she doesn't have any clothes on but some beige undergarments. My dad zooms in on the big smile that my mother had on her face, and when he zoomed back out to show the entire landscape again, the woman was gone. Ew, what a freak. I mutter to myself as I push the eject button. I look through my options and I next choose the one labeled, 4th of July, 89. The 4th of July was always one of my favorite holidays. I insert the tape and the image adjusts itself. I met with a moment that I swear I almost remember. It's me and my paternal grandma. I'm sitting on her lap and she's helping me eat some steamed clams. Those were my favorite food on earth at the time I recall. I remember that I could eat piles and piles of them. I found it comforting that my dad and grandma got to be together now. I watched as she wiped the stream of melted butter that dripped from my mouth as I chewed, reveling in the bliss of a carefree child life. 
My dad pans the camera around at the party shooting my grandparents' huge yard. The hustle and bustle of the extravagant cookouts they had all summer long. Kids running with sparklers. Adults talking while eating their grilled meats. And their big, glorious home that they were always so proud of. The perfect life. My grandparents were the embodiment of perfection. And it's probably why my parents strive for it so hard as well. As my dad pans the scenery, I get a sense of dread when the shot passes the sliding glass window. No way. I mutter to myself as I lurch forward and slam the rewind button. The scene backs up to the window and I hit pause. She's there again, inside the house this time. The same woman with the black hair, facing away from the camera and leaning against the sliding glass door. She's closer this time, maybe 20 yards or so, standing perfectly still, almost like a statue. The weirdest part is that no one acknowledges her. They act as if she's supposed to be there and fits right in, or as if she isn't there at all. Something about this gives me a feeling that I can't shake, like a fight or flight scenario. I take the tape out and grab the one closest to me, Easter 91. I put it in and quickly press play as I feel sweat beginning to coat my palms. The scene opens to me and my Sunday best with a candy in a basket, though this time I'm not so interested in reminiscing as I am in looking for this woman. And without fail, there she is. She is right outside of the dining room window still facing away. She's close enough now that I can see that she's soaked to the bone, and her arms are bent at an unnatural angle, so that her palms are behind her, pressed against the glass, and her fingers are bent as if they were trying to claw through with her nails. As the scene moves around her, with my mother helping me open a piece of chocolate, and our little family dog running around hoping for some scraps, she just stands there, still like a photograph. My breathing quickens and I grab the last of the tapes. It read, Christmas 91. I take a deep inhale and carefully put the last tape in. The scene comes up on the screen and it's how I always remembered our Christmases. The tree in the corner of the living room. The slightly dim, bit warm lighting of our lamp reflects so beautifully off the ornaments in the wee hours of the morning. I watch as my past self opens presents and holds them up with glee. My mom stands next to me in her fuzzy pink robe, blonde hair is still in rollers, holding her coffee and watching my excitement. I sigh a breath of relief, not seeing that wretched woman. But just then, my heart skips and my breath gets caught in my throat. There she is, I see her, in the corner just behind the tree, standing there facing away from the camera again. She's just a feet away from me this time. I watch this woman in paralyzing terror, almost completely blocking out the joy of Christmas Day going on around her. I can feel the anger and evil radiating off of her from the video standing there unnoticed in a scene where she doesn't belong. But then I notice movement. She's painstakingly slowly turning her head. Just before I get a glimpse of her face, I push the eject button so hard that it nearly knocks the VHS tape off the shelf. I cannot catch my breath and my body is numb. Something about this feels so wrong, terrible, heartbreaking and evil at the same time. When I'm able to feel my legs, I grab the tapes and I run back to the attic. I dig through the box some more. There has to have been answers in here. Who is that woman? Why is she always around? There's a tape, one in particular that I feel drawn to. I hesitantly pick it up and I take it downstairs. I walk to the VHS player and read the label one last time. Evan's birth. I take a deep breath in and gently place it in the video. 
The scenery before me is my mother holding me as a baby, swaddled and serene. They're at home. I recognize the bathroom from my childhood house. This must be after they brought me back. After a few seconds, the tape ends. It must have been watched and not rewinded. I rewind the tape, unable to look at the screen until it's at the beginning. It's time, John. My mom says to the camera with a warm grin as the tape starts. I can't believe it's finally here. Our baby boy is going to come home. He says from behind the image. You can hear the giddiness in his soul escape through his words. My mother begins walking up the stairs. Her full body comes into view, and I'm taken aback by how thin she is. My mother says that she hardly showed when she was pregnant with me, but she looks as thin as I always remember her being. As they both get up the stairs, she gives my dad a kiss and he says, After you. With a chuckle and you can see his hand gesture towards the door, she opens it slowly, and nothing could prepare me for the scene ahead. In the bathtub, there's a woman and she's sickly pale. Her face is black and blue with bruising and she's undressed except for those beige bra and panties. I can see that her face is the only area with injury, but it looked horrible. Her nose purple and crooked. From what I can see, if her lips be on the gag, they looked cracked and swollen. She's quietly groaning in pain. Her arms are underneath her body and they seem stuck there. You can see the water is pink with blood and worst of all, she's heavily pregnant. It's time, Emily. He's coming. My mother says to the woman. You can see the woman begin to sob as she shakes her head quickly. And you can hear her saying, uh-huh, uh-uh, from behind the gag covering her mouth. I, for some reason, am unable to turn my head away from the horror on screen. No matter how bad I try to look away, it's as if my eyes are magnetized to the screen. My mind is screaming at me to shut it off, but I can't. Not for my mother's waistband, she pulls out a large carving knife. Be careful, Marianne. My father warns her. You can hear the smile in his face and the way that he speaks. Don't worry, John. Protecting our baby is of the utmost importance. He's going to be absolutely perfect. She says while tracing the edge of the blade with her finger. She then places one hand over the woman's mouth and says to her, Thank you for this, Emily. It's the right thing. We can give this baby the life he deserves. One someone like you never could. And before I knew what was happening, she slowly and methodically begins using the knife. She screams and writhes in pain. Should we shut her up? My dad asks my mom. Why bother? The closest neighbors are a mile away. And what are the odds someone will be walking around outside in February? She says, nonchalantly with a shrug. God... I've never seen so much red in my life. The woman crying and screaming, or at least trying to. Between the gag and my mother's tight grip, hardly any noise is getting through. And the knife was cutting easily through Emily like hot butter. My mother was so focused on her task that the woman crying and rolling around to get away hardly phased her attention. She started to roll onto her side and my mother smacked her in the face. Knock it off. Do you want me to hurt this baby? If he gets cut, that's on you. As my mother continues on, she lets go of the woman's face to reach around inside. You can hear the sickening sound as her arms move around. There he is. I hear my mother say in the tape, and it draws my attention back to her. From the abdomen of this woman, my mother pulls out a baby. Red covers my mother's arms up to her elbows, and in her stained arm is a little boy lightly crying. We agreed on Evan, right? After my dad. My father asks. Of course, honey. My mom said as she washes off the baby and her own arms in the sink. 
She then wraps me up in a little blue blanket. What are we going to do with her? My father asked, pointing the camera at the other woman. She's looking in the direction of the camera, but she looks so out of it, she probably couldn't see any more anyway. Her eyes look bloodshot and empty. My mother looks at her and with a tiss tiss tisk as she thinks. And there's no point in her suffering more, she says. She hands me off to my dad and, and just then she walks to the woman and pushes her head underwater face down. You can see the woman is struggling the best she can, but due to the loss that she had taken, she had no strength and quickly succumbed to her water grave, left to drown in a pool of her own fluids. My mother then takes me back from my dad and holds me for the camera, and he kisses my head, showing me the scene that I was greeted with when I put the tape in. I sit there for a moment, my breathing ragged and my body feeling frozen. There's no way this isn't a prank. I wanted to move, but I can't. Now I look up at the black screen to see my own reflection. I look pale and then I see her just behind me. That woman lurking right over my shoulder, illuminated by the dim light of the table lamp. I quickly turn around and see nothing there. I run upstairs as fast as I can and sift through the box once again. My baby book. I open it and I'm greeted with posed photos of my mother who appears to be pregnant at and photos of myself as an infant. There's a photo of my mother and several other pregnant women labeled birthing class. I flip the page. A piece of hair for my first haircut. A stamp of my footprint. I turn the page again and I was shocked by what I found. Newspaper clippings. Young expecting Fresno woman still missing. The headline read, Emily Jean 19 went missing from Fresno, California in September of last year. She would be six months pregnant by now. Was reported to be last seen hitchhiking on the side of the interstate. Her whereabouts are unknown. Her family begs her to call home if she is able and is offering a $25,000 reward for her safe return. Underneath there was a photo of this young woman, and I see my own dark green eyes looking back at me from her, and the same nose that I've always hated. She had my dark brown hair, I remember I thought. It was odd because neither of my parents had had it. My mother, or the woman whom I thought was my mother, had told me her parents had my color, and they had passed before I was born, so how would I know? I feel the knot on my stomach tighten and I turn the page. The headline read, Body of Missing Woman Emily Jean Found in Local Pond Emily Jean, 19, who had been missing since September. Her remains had been found this Monday. Her body was heavily redacted. Fresno PD says they have no comments at this time. My heart has never pounded so hard. I could feel sweat dripping from my forehead. Is this woman my mother? Are my parents really killers and how do I turn her in? My mind is racing over this situation that it feels like a fever dream. It doesn't feel like real life. I feel like my heart could give out at any second. How could my parents be such monsters? My racing mind is interrupted by the quick, heavy thuds of running up the stairs. You weren't supposed to see that, Evan. I hear an old, creaky voice from behind me. I turn around, and there's the woman who I had been told as my mother, standing in the doorframe backlit by the hall light. As far as I knew, she couldn't stand, let alone a speed run up the stairs. And worst of all, in her hand, she held the carving knife from the old home videos. It isn't Satan, the government, aliens, demons, nuclear, or storms. Written by Grindhorus. Doorbells are not inherently scary. The doorbell rings and the door is answered. 
Of course, what's on the other side of the door can change the interaction significantly. I'm a house painter by trade. Generally, I work by myself or with Joe, a middle-aged, silent type. He's a nice guy, a talented painter, and a devout Christian. It's funny to think that his faith actually has a little to do with what happened that day. It was a Wednesday afternoon. The entire day was spent hanging drywall, completely covering the ceilings of two bedrooms. If you've ever covered a ceiling in drywall, we can swap stories of shoulder pain and screw shards in our fingers later. Two women lived in the house, with its cracking walls, dusty everything, and strange ability to cast shadows in a room facing direct sunlight. Somewhat elderly women, sisters I think, but I wasn't too sure. Kind women, but they had a tendency to walk completely in sync with one another. It was like if you've seen the movie Don't Look Now. It reminded me of the old women in that. Man, that was a pretty good movie. It used a suspense effectively. But after a while, the lack of anything happening became a bit mundane. Oh, sorry. I'm rambling. I daydream when I work, so documenting the day brings out the talker in me. But anyway, the women had laughed for several hours. I have no idea where they went. But judging by the empty lorizapam bottles and compulsive conversations about death on the news, I would say nowhere important. Just getting away from the loneliness and depression that is the Philadelphia suburbs for a while. So... It was myself, Joe, and a dying radio set to the oldies. The radio would turn to static whenever I walked by, only me which I found odd. I joked in my head about possibly being a demon. These are the things that one thinks about while screw gunning a 400 spiral into gypsum. Spiral into gypsum would actually be a decent band name, honestly. Uh, there I go, rambling again. The stories never stop aboard this train of thought. The doorbell rang. Joe called from the other room. Hey Dave, you mind grabbing that? My hands are full. Should we really be answering the door with the homeowner's gone? Well, no. I suppose whoever it is can always come back later. Silence. Um, come help me drive fit this. I sigh, knowing soon that I'll be holding my arms above my head for a lot longer than I would want to. One hour passes and the women haven't come home. We've exhausted our drywall surplus upstairs. So Joe charges me to run downstairs to grab another sheet myself. Maneuvering a cumbersome piece of sheetrock is not something that I'm excited about. But the sooner that we finish, the sooner that I can go and kill all the ice cream in my freezer. Since I'm basically a child. Frickin' sue me. Charging down the stairs, I stop. The front door is covered by a thin curtain, obscuring the window in it somewhat, but the sunlight pouring through outlines a silhouette on the other side of the door. My cock and eyebrow, as if anybody can see my confusion. Whoever happened to be standing there was completely still, so I decided to assume it was one of the women on their porch admiring the bland street corner. It's funny how we instantly rationalize what we don't understand. It isn't so much that we make sense of the world, but we invent our own reality where nothing bad can happen. My hand gripped the tarnished handle and turned, pulling the door open to reveal a man in a black suit. 
a suit that would have been more at home 200 years prior. He was wearing a bowler hat and looked vaguely similar to an elderly Sinatra. His voice, however, was not from the chairman, deep in leaving a bitter taste in my mouth. Hello, friend. I started to think that you would never answer the door. It was at this point that I should have closed the door in his face, but frankly, I don't think it would have changed the events that followed. Um, I didn't know you were there this whole time. You a friend of Maureen's. He had to know the homeowner somehow, right? Uh, right. Breathe and remember. Rationalize. Oh no. I'm just here to deliver an envelope to a... Joe House. Is that what that says? The man pulled some reading glasses out of his pocket. Yes, Joe House. Do you happen to be Joe? Uh, no, I'm not Joe. But I could take this to him if you'd like. He's right upstairs. No, I can't allow you to touch the envelope. But if you would allow me to come in, I'd be more than happy to deliver the message and be on my way. I heard steps from behind me. I was wondering when Joe would get impatient. Dave, where's the drywall? Who's that? It's not important, but this envelope is for Joe House. Would you be Joe House? The old man was exceedingly pleasant, cracking a smile without a hint of malice. I am. Joe approached the man as one would approach a leper. He snatched the off-white envelope, opening it at arm's length. If this is anthrax, I'm making sure that you die with me, old man. Joe was also a pretty big conspiracy theorist. The man just grinned. It's nothing of the sort, but I appreciate the humor. Joe removed a single piece of paper from the envelope, reading it aloud, brutally grimacing. It isn't solar storms, it isn't demons, it isn't nuclear. He paused. Then what the heck is it? Oh, I just delivered the messages. The old man gave a stiff wave before collapsing into a pathetic heap. The police arrived promptly, pulling up in a storm of light and sound. They took statements from each of us. They surveyed the area. The homeowners finally came back, obviously horrified that an old man had died on their porch. This was made more bizarre by the woman asserting that they had never before seen the unfortunate visitor. The old man was a complete stranger to everyone, apparently. He had nothing in his pockets, no tags on his clothing, no fingerprints. His teeth were dentures with no label or serial number branded onto them. The cops fidgeted for a while at taking pictures, shooting their guns at each other in a weird take on a water gun fight, punching stray animals. We all joined in and it was a great time. Okay, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But the officers really didn't know what to do. So naturally, they told us to call them if anything else happened. And then they were gone. Maureen's supposed sister had gone upstairs to lie down. Joe, myself, and Maureen made awkward small talk. Having no stake in this old man. And wanting to banish the ordeal from my memory. John made no mention of the envelope to the police or to the sisters. Eventually, we all decided the best course of action was for Joe and I to just go ahead and continue working. Man, do I wish we just left. I was working in the front bedroom, so I pushed the door open, not remembering having closed it, but telling myself that I'm forgetful sometimes. There was Maureen's sister, Diana, lying dead on the floor, her eyes wide, chest and stomach, sliced open revealing a bloodless cavity. Her arm was propped up with a wooden board, forcing it to point directly at the ceiling. One of the pieces of drywall had a new arrangement of nails. The blackheads all gathered in a pentagram, 
It appeared to be bleeding. Red fluid dripping from the old nail holes. I guess I should mention the rest of the room too. Diana wasn't the only dead body. One of the police officers and two people that I had never seen before all lay dead and empty, pointing up to the ceiling. The furniture, which only consisted of a bed and a desk, were covered in sheets. Joe's tools, two different sized pliers, a drywall saw, a drill and a painter's putty knife sat neatly on top of the desk. The bed was covered in envelopes. It may have been a gut reaction to the scene, but Joe ran frantically to the envelopes, tearing each one open like a spoiled kid on Christmas. It isn't Satan, it isn't monsters, it isn't demons, it isn't a serial killer, it isn't aliens. The envelopes all contained variations of the trope, gradually turning Joe's tone from urgent to pleading. He collapsed into tears. My heart was racing, but until you've seen something atrocious, you don't know how you would react. Maureen vomited before passing out on the floor. I stood still, sweating, wringing my hands. The voice grip in my chest signaled a panic attack. What do I do now? What did this? And then Joe opened the last envelope. This one was completely black, buried beneath the others. Unlike the previous letters, this was opened with care. The vigor was gone. Joe stood still for a while before turning to look out the window. Where I was situated at the door, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but I didn't need to see it. Get the heck out of here now. Joe turned to me in a frenzy, running towards the door as I heard his shattering glass. I glanced back as I flew down the stairs, only to see Joe climb at the hardwood floor, nails tearing off into cascading red. He was being dragged by a scabbed hand with long, yellowing nails. I didn't see what the hand belonged to, but it didn't matter. I thought of going back to save Maureen, but as I plowed through the first door, her body exploded from the window above me. The sound of bones cracking and ripping accompanied the unnatural bounce of her body. Run, little rabbit. It's hunting season. A monotonous tone, a sour taste in my mouth, the taste of garbage and hate, not my own hate. I threw open my car door, remembering suddenly that my battery had been temperamental lately. One turn of the key, grinding sounds. Two turns of the key, grinding sounds. Three turns of the key, no sounds. I looked up at the second floor window, feeling eyes on me. Being parked across the street, the view of the window was clear enough to make out an abnormally large head, given that appearance by a mass of matted, straw-like black hair. The hair obscured all facial features except the scarred, dirty cheeks and jaw, adorned with, well, it wasn't a smile. The mouth was open, displaying gritted caramel teeth. The expression didn't indicate any emotion. Four turns. The window gazer slithered from the window, limbs being used in the wrong way to exit onto the overhang above the front door. Five turns. The window gazer reached a scabbed hand onto the drain pipe, attempting to slide down the pipe upside down. The nails and brackets in the loop tore flesh from the thing, dripping red onto the pavement in a sinister shower. Six turns. The thing lay still on the ground for several seconds before wildly flailing its bony body parts, the whole time seemingly training that eyeless gaze on me. Mouth still open, teeth still gritted, blood still leaking from fresh wounds. Seven turns. Lucky seven, the car came to life, turning the corner and I was gone right into traffic. Crap, crap, crap. Cars in front, cars behind. I glanced behind me expecting to see the beast wandering towards the main road. But instead, I saw Marine and Diana pull their car around the block. My phone buzzed. 
It was Joe. Uh, hello? Where the heck are you, man? I... You're okay. What the heck are you talking about? You ran to your car all panicky. I'm concerned for you. I pulled the car to the side of the road, staring at my hands for no reason other than that they existed. The phone was still on and Joe asked if I was there, but I couldn't bring myself to answer. Was it really Joe? I decided to ask him one thing. What did it say in the last envelope? Static for a second, and then a sour taste in my mouth. I knew I wasn't going back to that house. It's curiosity. I would like to extend a large thank you to today's Creepscast sponsor, Omaha Steaks. It's starting to heat up outside and one of my favorite traditions is busting out the grill and having family and friends over for a cookout. Nothing brings people together quite like delicious food. And Omaha Steaks has been supplying my family with mouth-watering meals for as long as I can remember. There's a good reason they've been the leader of gourmet steaks and food since 1917. Just like I can't wait to share some amazing Omaha Steaks cuisine with my family. I'm very excited to be able to share today's special offer with all of you. Visit omahasteaks.com and enter Mr. Creeps into the search bar and order the Spring Grill Pack today. You'll save over 50% and you'll get 4 Omaha Steaks burgers and 4 boneless chicken breasts free with your order. And let me be the first to tell you, these burgers and chicken breasts are incredibly juicy, flavorful, and downright delicious. These guys know their stuff and they're willing to back it up with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you aren't satisfied with your purchase for any reason whatsoever, they'll replace or refund your entire order, whichever you prefer. But I assure you that you'll enjoy every bite. Again, head over to AlmaSteaks.com and enter Mr. Creeps into the search bar and order the Spring Grill Pack today. Thank you again to Alma Steaks for sponsoring today's video. I'm a firefighter, and what I found in the last fire creeped me out. Written by Horror Writer 1717 There was a notebook that survived the last fire I was called to. I found it in the smoldering remains of the ashes. I'm not sure if I believe this story in it or not, but I thought I would share it just in case it is real. Mama said there would be days like this. It's a nice thought, isn't it? It speaks of a concerned parent trying to comfort her child to the harsh realities of the world. The problem is, I don't recall my mama ever saying anything like that to me. Even if she did, I don't think in her wildest nightmare that she could have imagined a day like that one. The day I leaned against the inside of a train tunnel, soaked in sweat and grime, glaring at the train tracks that dripped with the blood of my friend. Blood that should have been mine. My name is Joe, and I don't think I'm named after anybody. Mama just always called me Joe. There are lots of things that Mama always just did, like beating the tar out of me when I sassed her, beating the tar out of me if I didn't kill anything for supper, beating the tar out of me the day I told her that I wanted to learn to read. At this point, you wouldn't think that I had much tar left in me, but you couldn't tell Mama that. She was a big woman, and I think beating me made her feel better about herself. I grew up in a little shack in the middle of nowhere. Mama always called it a cabin, but it was really just four walls and a roof, hastily put together with stolen boards and nails from an old barn down the road. Mama always told me that she took good care of me. Of course, she told me that the cabin was a huge house and that learning was bad. I guess in a way it was for her. I wasn't allowed to have picture books or anything like that. I'll teach you everything you need to know, Mama said. And that's what I call a half-truth. She taught me everything she needed me to know, like how to cook, clean, cut firewood, and take care of her when she was sick. 
anything other than what was on Mama's forbidden list. How does all this lead to a boy watching his friend being horribly dismembered by a speeding train? Well, stick with me for a little bit. We'll get there. Mama didn't have a job, so we hunted and grew food. Once a month, the two of us would drag our small, rickety cart to a truck stop on the outskirts of Larson, about 15 miles away. We would set up alongside the road, selling homegrown vegetables during the day. Mama never let me see or talk to any of the people, though. They ain't no good, she said, and I don't want you taken after them. Mama had a special word for the people who lived in any town. Arrogant. I didn't know what it meant at the time, but found out later that it meant folks who don't see things the same as Mama. At night, we would go shopping in dumpsters, and the next day, we would head back home with a few dollars in Mama's pockets and a cart full of treasures. Frost Creek was only two miles from the cabin, but to reach it, you had to walk through a railroad tunnel. You had another thing that was on Mama's forbidden list. That tunnel took your daddy away from me. I ain't gonna let it take you too, she said. The funny thing about curiosity is you can bottle it up, but once it's out, there's no way of getting it back in. I found an old children's dictionary on one of our traps. You remember the kind that had the picture beside the word. Well, I started looking at that book, and before you know it, the stopper was out of my bottle. I lost a lot of tar the day Mama caught me with it. We ain't reading, folk. She screamed as she beat me. Nothing in that book is gonna put food on the table. But being young, dumb, and well, whatever, I snuck the book away from her and I hid it. This was the beginning of my new life. Isn't it funny how when you latch on to something new, the old just doesn't quite cut it anymore. There was a large, empty cave where I hid my treasures. The few children's books that I had snuck home my dictionary, and a pair of dress shoes that actually fit. I struggled to read the books, relying heavily on the pictures. My favorite was the one that told me about Halloween, Christmas, and Thanksgiving. Halloween was my favorite. The thought of getting all that candy just for putting on a costume made me feel excited. I planned my first trick-or-treat trip very carefully. I told mom that I'd be gone most of the day and into the night, picking her favorite berries for her, which were already picked and hidden in my cave. She knew that it was a long, dangerous way to the patch where those berries grew. She wanted to tell me no, but I could see the hunger in her eyes. It's funny how desire can override concern. Having gotten her blessing, I went to my cave, put on my dress shoes, ragged jeans, and shirt, I wrapped my supper in a red bandana and hung it at the back of the stack. With my outfit complete, I walked down to the railroad tracks and stared at the tunnel. The sun was just starting to set, bathing it in an eerie red glow. The stones that formed the opening looked like giant bloody teeth, just waiting to eat me. Mama always told me that there was evil that lurked in that tunnel. I used to think that she was only trying to scare me. Just to keep me out. But that evening things were different. As I stepped into the dark, I felt the wickedness inside me. Like I knew I was doing wrong, but I didn't care. I ate my supper as I walked through the tunnel, leaving the bandana nearly empty. When I came out on the other side, the world had been transformed. Everywhere I looked were bright, shining lights and people hurrying this way and that. I stopped and stared at a giant yellow am. The smells that came from inside made my mouth water. Someday I'll be rich enough to eat there. Mama wouldn't like that, I argued with myself. I dragged myself away from the site and started down a street that, on any other night, would have seemed bizarre beyond description. Yet tonight it was the greatest thing that I had ever seen. I smiled from ear to ear as ghosts holding plastic pumpkins that floated by. Next was a trio of miniature superheroes arguing over which one had the most candy. I walked up to the first house that I saw and I knocked on the door. 
The porch light came on and an old man flung open the door. What? He snarled. Trick or treat, I said holding out my bandana. The old man glared at me. Do you see my porch light on? He said. Yes, I said, looking up. The old man looked up too and harumphed, as several more trick-or-treaters were drawn toward the light, like brightly colored insects. He quickly turned the light off and they drifted away. You see that boy, the old man said, pointing toward the other houses. All those idiots with the porch lights on. Yeah, those are the ones you go to for your satanic pagan candy. Not understanding the words satanic or pagan, I turned to leave, but the old man held me back. I do have a treat for you, though, he said with a wicked grin. Since you were kind enough to wake me up, wait here. The old man disappeared and reappeared quick enough to be a magician. There you go, he said, holding out a rotten banana. I took it and tears walled up my eyes. Thank you, I said, hugging him. It was the last thing that he had expected. He pulled away from me, harumped, and slammed the door in my face. I peeled the banana and ate it as I walked toward the next house, making sure that the porch light was on. As I started up the walkway, I finished the banana and tossed the peel in the yard. A large man in his mid-thirties stood on the lighted porch, holding a bowl of candy and frowning as I approached. A trick or treat. I said, holding out my bandana. Are you going to throw that away? The man said gruffly. I looked at my bandana, seeing no reason why I should throw it away. No, not the bandana, the man said. The banana. He pointed to the discarded peel that I had thrown into his yard. I picked it up and I looked at the large man. Trash can, he said, pointing toward the street. I walked out and saw a can sitting beside a streetlight and looked at the man, and pointed towards the can. He nodded his approval and I threw the peel in and then walked away. Hey, called the large man, don't you want any candy? I ran back to the porch, looked into the bowl filled with colorful wrappers and I grabbed a handful. Only take two, the man said, it's too early, I need to have some for the other kids. I hesitated and then picked the two that had the most interesting wrappers. Didn't your parents ever teach you not to litter? The man asked. Not understanding the word litter, I bluffed by nodding my head. Where are they anyway? The man said. Who? Your parents. Daddy's gone and Mama's at home, I said. Your mother let you go trick-or-treating by yourself. The man said with an edge in his voice. Sensing that I had done something wrong, I said, I, I gotta go, and then I ran across the street and hid behind the tree. Maybe I should just give up and go home. I pulled out one of the pieces of candy, opened it, and took a bite. My mouth exploded with sweetness. I gobbled it and the next piece right away. I could feel the blood rushing through my body. The sudden burst of energy dragged me into the next house. The lady smiled and complimented my hobo suit, and then gave me three pieces of candy, which I devoured as soon as I got out of sight. The rest of the evening was more of the same, polite smiles and lots of candy. My bandana never got a chance to fill up. An hour later, I headed back out of town, moving a lot slower. My stomach began to feel strange and make sounds that I had never heard it make. I stopped at the trash can that I had thrown by a banana peel into and suddenly upchucked all the candy that I had eaten. The large man came outside and watched me heaving into the trash can. Hey, are you okay? He asked. Yeah, I said, breathing hard. Here, he said, handing me some paper towel. Clean yourself up and follow me. He waited for me to finish and then started walking towards the middle of town. I followed him until we came to a building with a large star on the front of it, and I hesitated. Come on in, the man said. It's okay. The large man walked inside, closely followed by me. Evening, Sheriff, said a man behind a raised counter. Who's your friend? What's your name, boy? The sheriff asked. 
I'm Joe. Well, Joe what? Just Joe. But what's your last name? I don't understand, I said. My mama always called me Joe. Okay, well, what's your mama's name? Mama? I said confused. Joe Mama, the man at the desk said, really? The sheriff chuckled a little. Okay, kid, let's get you cleaned up. Follow me. He took me to the back hallway where the cells were, and I got nervous right away. I don't worry, kid. I'm just letting you shower and get some clean clothes. After I had showered and changed, he brought me back out and took my picture and prints. Let's run him against the National Runaway Network, he told the deputy. Yeah, sure thing, boss. Nothing came back. Joe, how long you been living on the street? The sheriff asked. I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything. Where's your mother live? Once again, I was silent. I think I know exactly what you need to loosen that tongue of yours. Uh, come on. He left the station with me tagging along, carrying my old clothes. How's your stomach feeling? He asked. A little better, I said. Good, because we're here. It was a large, two-story brick house. I could see from the street lamp that the house was well kept. When the woman answered the door, she seemed familiar. Oh, hello, Sheriff, she said cheerfully. Oh, hello, Marcy. I got someone for you to meet. We've already met, she said, smiling. He was dressed like a hobo. Well, I'm not so sure it was a costume. I think he's a runaway. She shook her head and made a sad, clucking sound. Well, come on in. I've got to get going if it's all the same to you. Oh, sure, Sheriff, she said. You know, our door is always open. Thanks, Marcy. I'll send the paperwork over for Joe in the morning. Sounds good, thanks. Hey, take care, kid, he told me. You're in good hands here. I'll see you around. Thank you, sir, I said. He laughed. You can call me Ted. And then he nodded and walked away. Marcy showed me our room, apologizing for how small it was. Little did she know that it was nearly the same size as the shack that I lived in with Mama. I laid down in the soft bed and fell instantly asleep. I woke with a start and panicked, alone in a huge room that I didn't recognize, surrounded by conference that I never had at home. I jumped out of bed, threw on my old clothes, and snuck out of the bedroom window. I headed back toward the tunnel with Dawn about an hour away, feeling guilty for leaving Mama to begin with. But Marcy seemed so friendly and the bed was so soft. By the time that I had reached the tunnel, my mind was in an all-out war with itself over which place to call home. Lost in thought, I wasn't paying attention to where I was and I had meandered into the tunnel. Instead of going through it as quickly as I could, I kicked rocks and I pondered life. Ray was the closest thing that I had to a friend. He lived in a shack, two hollows up from the place that I lived in. He was born with only one working arm. The other one just wasn't there. One tiny finger grew out of his shoulder. It was the weirdest thing that I ever saw. And Ray didn't talk either. He only had a stomp for a tongue. I never knew if he was born that way or if he had said something real bad to his daddy. I never knew how old Ray was either. He was full grown when I was still toddling around at the shack, but he always had the brain of a child. Sometimes when I would go dumpster shopping, I would bring Ray back an old beat up action figure that somebody had tossed out. He loved playing with them, but the first thing he did with each one was tear off the right arm. I guess he thought it made it more like him. Ray loved the trains, and every time I saw him, it was somewhere near the tracks. Tonight was no exception. The hum grew steadily louder. The air itself seemed charged with electricity. The ground shook as I stood frozen by fear and indecision. The deafening scream of the horn jolted me into action. As I ran, the realization washed over me that I was about to die horribly. I stumbled blindly into the powerful light, helpless and lost. But suddenly a hand grabbed me, and it yanked me back from the tracks and shoved me into the emergency cutout as the train careened past. 
The wind from the passing train made me cover my face. Once the train had passed, I looked around to see who my savior was, but no one was there. I slowly stepped out of the cutout and looked around. Ten yards away, sitting in between the tracks with a colorful piece of plastic, I picked it up. It was a dirty action figure with one of its arms ripped off. Oh my god, Ray. I looked down and saw a small splatter of blood. As I followed the tracks to the opening of the tunnel, it intensified. By the time that I tasted fresh air, the rails looked like the floor of a slaughterhouse. So, that's how I came to be there, watching my friend's blood drip down off the cold steel rails. The noblest self-sacrificing act that I had ever witnessed, and I was the only one who knew about it. If that was the end of the story, most of you would just sadly shake your head and move on. But the story was just beginning. I stood at a crossroads in my young life. If I went back home and told Mama what happened, I would lose a lot of tar for going through the tunnel and lying to her. If I just up and laughed, Mama would come looking for me. And God knows what would happen if she found me. I ran to my cave, threw all of my important things in my ratty old backpack, and then ran back to the tunnel. Next, I took the basket full of berries and threw them here and there, anywhere there was blood, and then sat the basket in the middle of the tracks and waited. I could just see in the light as dawn began to fight off the darkness. Joe! came Mama's voice. I froze. I didn't think she could see me. She was probably just calling out hoping that I was close enough to hear her. My resolve waned every time she called my name. Finally, I saw two lights. One was a mama's old hurricane lamp, and the other was an oncoming train. My heart leaped and failed at the same time. The train approached quickly, its horn had nearly deafened me. It drove into the tunnel, destroying the basket. As soon as it had passed, I ran through. And just as I came out, the lamp appeared at the other end. I slowly peeked around the corner and could barely make out the silhouette of a woman on her knees between the tracks. She was rocking back and forth, holding something in her arms. Finally, I realized it was the remains of the basket. My heart nearly failed me. I wanted to run back to her and tell her that it was alright. I took a half step forward and then I remembered Ray. Not wanting his sacrifice to be in vain, I quickly turned my back in the tunnel and started toward town. Ten minutes later, I climbed back into the open bedroom window, closed it behind me, and turned around to see Marcy standing there with her arms folded. That's strike one, she said firmly. You never leave this house without asking first. Sorry, I said hanging my head. Well, come on then and get some breakfast. That's it? Well, what else were you expecting? A beating. Who beat you? Marcia asked, her eyes moist with sympathy. Mama, I said, shrugging my shoulders. She hugged me tightly and whispered, I will never beat you. She suddenly released me and went downstairs, dabbing at her eyes. I followed and ate the largest breakfast that I'd ever had. It didn't take long for me to start thinking that I had picked the right household. The year was full of ups and downs. Marcy and her kids, Paul and Sharon, not only welcomed me into their house, but they took me on as their pet project. I had never heard the phrase, a foster family before. Within six months, I had caught up on years of neglect and was able to go to school, only one grade lower than my age bracket. They rallied around me as their cause and... We became a true family like I had never known. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Next Halloween, I went trick-or-treating again. Sharon had just turned 14 and decided that she was too mature for trick-or-treating. Paul and I had dressed up as pirates and we went together but got separated in a crowd of costumes. As I looked for him, I realized how close I was to the tunnel. Hesitantly, I went over and peered into it. To my surprise, I saw a woman silhouetted kneeling in the middle of the tracks, holding a basket as she rocked back and forth. Mama? 
I whispered. Somehow the figure heard me. The silhouette looked up straight at me. Without knowing why, I felt a sudden chill run up my spine. The figure stood and began to slowly walk toward me. I was drawn towards it and started into the tunnel. Instead of being overwhelmed with relief and love, I felt as if I was suffocating. Suddenly, the figure disappeared, and once again my curiosity had overwhelmed my common sense. I strained my eyes to see where the figure had gone. I pulled out a small flashlight and I shone it around the tunnel. My shadow seemed bigger. I shone the flashlight on it, but it didn't go away. The light just disappeared into it, like an empty abyss that even light I couldn't escape from. And then I realized that it wasn't my shadow. It was Mama's. As I looked, the air became heavy and hard to breathe. I felt a presence behind me and heard the word, Joe, whispered in my ear. I panicked and froze. The dark figure came closer. I felt like I was suffocating. An icy tendril touched my face, breaking me out of my stupor. I ran with all my might and before I knew it, I was back home. I slammed the door and leaned against it, shaking. It's about time you got home. Paul and I were about to go out looking for you. Marcy called from the kitchen. I was trick-or-treating. I had to focus to slow my breathing. Fine, I said, to buy a few precious moments to recover. Well, I made a pumpkin pie, but I'm sure you ate half your candy already, she said. Yeah, I'm kind of tired. I'm going to go to bed. She smiled that warm smile that let me know everything would be okay. Good night, sweetie. A few hours later, I was having a wonderful sugar-fueled dream about diving into a swimming pool full of candy when my dream went dark. It felt so cold that I tried to snuggle up in my blanket, but it didn't warm me. I opened my eyes to find the room totally black. No lights at all. I looked around to try to get my bearings and I saw a shadow beside the bed move on its own. It reached out for me, but I recoiled. Joe, it whispered. Mama? I slowly reached toward it. It felt like liquid ice running over my hand. Home, it said, looking out the window toward the tunnel. I looked to where it was pointing. No, Mama, this is my home now. The shadow drew back as Marcy stumbled into my room half asleep. What's wrong, honey? Is all that sugar? She stopped dead when she saw the shadow hovering over me. This is my new mama, I said. She treated me good, taught me to read, and she never once beat me. The shadow seemed to consider this. Cho. Marcy whispered to me without taking her eyes off the shadow. I'll explain later, I whispered back. The shadow whispered, Blood! Black tendrils shot into Marcy's ears. She screamed but was silenced when the shadow filled her mouth and eyes from the inside, making her look like a living skull. I have no idea the kind of hell she was going through on the inside, but outside her body was flailing around uncontrollably. Blood flew as she smashed herself against the walls as though, looking for an escape that she could never find. Stop it, Mama, I screamed, but dared not make a move for fear of being pummeled by Marcy. Finally, the tendrils came out of Marcy's ears and she collapsed in a bloody heap. Paul and Sharon wandered into the room, rubbing their eyes. What's all the commo- Sharon was cut short by the sight of the blood and her mother face down on the floor. Mom! She and Paul yelled, running towards her as the shadow reached for them. No, Mama! I dove toward the shadow, trying to tackle it or stop it somehow, but my body passed right through. It felt as if my very soul was frozen. I crashed to the floor on the other side, knocking over most of my possessions. I watched in horror as the tendrils penetrated their ears. The looks of terror and betrayal on their faces are something that I have never forgotten as the shadow turned them into bloody, struggling puppets as well. They slumped to the floor of my destroyed bedroom 
as I lost consciousness. I woke to a strange combination of hot and cold. The shadow brushing my cheek gave me shivers while flames licked the walls of my room. I looked around and saw my portable heater laying face down still running. Its red hot coils had caught the carpet on fire and the flames had spread like the flu in an elementary school. The fire surrounded me. I glanced over at the three mangled bodies that hadn't moved. I panicked and jumped through the window as the flames converged, landed on the grass in the cool night air, and then turned back to watch the fire devour what was my home and family. Home, the shadow whispered in my ear. No, mama, you destroyed my home. Home, it hissed while tendrils hovered next to my ears. Go ahead, I would rather die than go back with you. It hovered there as the mournful wail of the fire truck sounded in the distance. I reached out to the shadow. Let me live my life, mama. When it's done, I swear that I'll come home. The tendril encompassed my hand as I felt the urge to pull away. Just when I thought that I would get frostbite, the shadow evaporated. I collapsed onto the wet grass and stared at the flames as they climbed high into the night sky. The smell of plastic and wood burning made me feel like my own flesh was burning off of my bones, leaving me dead inside. The mournful wail ended as the fire trucks pulled up and bathed the neighborhood in flashing red light. One of the firemen guided me away from the house, sat me on the curb, and threw a blanket over my shoulders. Slowly, they got control of the fire. The angry orange flames were quenched like my hopes and dreams of a normal life. I watched as three gurneys, each holding a body, were wheeled out of what was left of the house. They each bypassed the ambulance and went straight to the coroner's van. I sat silently, staring at the ground. Joe, Ted said. My eyes didn't move, didn't blink. Questions flew from everywhere. The EMT, the sheriff, the judge, the jury. I didn't dare tell any of them the truth. After the trial, Ted drove me to my new home. We had pulled up to a huge brick building surrounded by fences covered in razor wire. The sign in front said, Larson Mental Institute. The gate opened and he drove inside. After he parked, he slumped forward against the steering wheel for a moment and then let out a long sigh. Look kid, if you do get better, I'll bring you back, I promise. Four orderlies came out and took me inside. I'd like to say that my time at the institute was helpful and productive. I'd like to say that I learned a lot and I came out a better person. I would like to say that Ted was as good as his word and came to get me when my time was up. As the wise man once said, two out of three ain't bad. I've written more journals about the other things that have happened to me in my life, but there's still a little more left to this story. Fifty years later, Grandpa, did that story really happen? Emily said, looking up into my face. Well, of course it did, I said. Are you calling your grandpa a liar? Uh, no, sir, she said. But whatever happened to that boy? No, he got better, grew up, got married, and had a wonderful family. I said, smiling. Okay, honey, Joe Jr. said. It's getting late, we better get going. Emily hugged me and got down off my lap. Look at me, Grandpa, I'm a princess, she said, twirling in a circle. And a beautiful princess, too, I said. I hope you get lots of candy this year. Here's some to get you started. And then I put a handful of candy in the little plastic pumpkin that she was carrying. She smiled and kissed me on the cheek and then skipped to the car. Well, we're going to get going, Joe Jr. said. Lots of trick-or-treating to do. I can't believe she's in second grade already. Where does the time go? Joe Jr. said, looking at his watch. Where indeed, I said, looking at Joe Jr. Are you sure you don't want to come live with us? Mom's been gone for over a year now. You know I can't do that. I made a promise. 
Oh, please, Dad, not this again. Joe Jr. said, putting his face in his hands. I thought they cured you of this at the Institute. Aren't you taking your meds? I smiled, but there was no warmth in it. Son, I can't cure my problem with medication. I pulled out a pocket knife and started to whittle. Joe Jr. just bowed his head in her resignation. Okay, I love you, Dad. Love you too, son. Emily waved as they drove the new SUV over the dirt road that crossed the tracks and started the long, winding trip toward town. I watched them go as I whittled absently. The red, orange, and yellow leaves had given way to the dull browns. Soon winter would rear its ugly head. I smiled as I looked at the empty wood pile with a complete lack of concern. My jaw clenched as the air around me grew heavy. A shadow appeared in the chair and I continued to whittle, trying my best to appear as if its presence didn't disturb me. The shadow reached its hand over and gently laid it on top of mine. Home, it whispered. Yes, Mama, I'm home. I smiled, ignoring the chills that shot up my arm, sat down the piece of wood that I had been carving into a train engine, picked up my pipe and packed it with tobacco and lit it. I took a long draw on it and watched the match continue to burn. The flame seemed to mesmerize me as if staring at a microcosm of my entire life and that tiny glowing chemical reaction. I barely ever smoked, but today was different. Today was a special day. As the flame burned down to my fingers, I dropped the match on top of the pile of whittled wood shavings and then got up and went inside. The recommended dosage for my sleeping pills was at two as needed. I took two dozen and swallowed them with a glass of water. As I write these last words that I will ever write, I just wanted to say a few goodbyes. To Ray, thank you for sacrificing your life to save mine. To Ted, thank you for giving me a new one. And to Mama, burn in hell just like I will. I laid down in the old, worn cot and looked around the cabin one last time. Night, Mama. I mumbled to the shadow. The shadow caressed my face, causing me to shiver. I laid my notebook down, set it in a bucket, and placed a blanket on top of it. Fire crews worked through the night to control the blaze before it became a full-blown forest fire. Once it was out, they had investigated the cause. They found the remains of the cabin and the remains of Joe. The fire had started on the front porch beside what was left of a wooden chair. There wasn't much left to identify, except a notebook that had been covered up in a blanket. The very notebook that I'm reading this story from. As they searched, they also found two graves. One was freshly dug and empty. The markers were badly burned but still legible. The first one said, Mama, and the second marker said, Joe, followed by a short passage. Death, where is thy sting? I inherited a collection of paranormal VHS tapes from my uncle, written by the Vespers Bell. So, you're trying to cash in on this whole analog horror fad, is that it? The eccentrically dressed, yet curmudgeonly old shopkeeper asked, as he disinterestedly pawed through the jumbled collection of off-brand VHS tapes that I had brought for him. I couldn't say that I blamed Mr. Orville Bucklesby for one bit of his lack of enthusiasm. If you believed even half the stories about him, he had fought German occultists in World War II traveled the multiverse with a supernatural circus, and regularly rubbed shoulders with the plethora of paranormal beings that allegedly haunted and visited Harrowick County. His oddity shop was stocked with a myriad of bizarre items, some of them of questionable authenticity to be sure, but all of them were more interesting than a few humble VHS cartridges. Analog horror, 
No, it's nothing like that, sir. I was uh, just thinking that there might be people out there who could get better use of it than I could, and that you would know how to get in touch with those people, I said with a nonchalant shrug. He eyed me suspiciously as he started reading over the labels on the tapes. What's with the cryptic titles then? He asked. This one's called, and we all fall down. They're all like that. You got crying girl in the woods. It's already too late. Why won't she forgive me? Etc. This one here just says, pity eyes. What's supposed to be on these things? Well, Mr. Bucklesby, I've been given to understand that you're familiar with the type of device referred to as inglorious retrovision. Is that correct? I asked hesitantly. Part of me was hoping that he would say no, that he would scoff at the very question, and I could go home and shove the videotapes back in the basement and forget about them. But he didn't. Instead, his expression changed from annoyed to serious, and he eyed the tapes with a renewed sense of cautious interest. You own a retrovision then, do you, son? He asked, avoiding eye contact with me. No, but my uncle did, I replied. He tinkered around with it and was able to hook up a VCR. Throughout the 80s and 90s, he recorded various signals that he picked up on it, right up until his death. With practically his dying breath, he told me to unhook the VCR and hide it with the tape collection, and I did. Not even a day later, the retrovision was gone, but the tapes were left untouched. I don't know who took it or how they knew about my uncle's death so quickly, but I can only assume that they didn't know about the tapes. I was terrified that they would find out about the modifications and come back for the tapes, but they never did, and they've been in my possession ever since. My uncle told me to never watch the tapes alone, and I was too scared to ever tell anyone else about them, so I've never watched them. I don't know what's on them. But I know the kind of things you can see on a retrovision, so I figured it might be worth something to the right buyer. Your uncle's been dead 20 years or so then. Why are you only selling them now? Orville asked, arching his eyebrows skeptically. Well, I was pretty much still a kid when he had died, and by the time that I was old enough to start looking into my uncle's occult connections, I had largely forgotten about the tapes, I explained. I just recently started poking around on heroichollows.net to see if I could find anyone that might have had anything to do with my uncle. And that's how I found out about this place. Hmm, you don't say. Maybe I ought to take out an ad on that site, he mused. You didn't happen to notice if Eve across the street was running any ads on there, did ya? I didn't notice any ads at all while I was there, actually, I answered. There's a short form thread about her, though. The prevailing opinion seemed to be that she's not much more than an Instagram psychic. Nah, <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but I love it. He cackled. Anywho, back to business. You're saying that these tapes are recordings from a retrovision that your uncle made. But other than that, you have no idea what's on them. That's correct, sir, yes. I nodded dutifully. He let out a slight grunt as he pensively weighed the video cassette in his hands. Listen, kid, before I make you an offer, I'm going to have to check at least a few of these to make sure that they're legit, he said, nodding to the 13-inch TV VCR copy he already had waiting on his desk. You okay with me popping this in? I hesitated for a moment. I knew before I came in that he would need to watch the videos and... I had been looking forward to finally seeing what was on the tapes myself, but after so many years of avoiding the tapes, I was perhaps understandably wary of what would happen when I finally unlocked their secrets. If you think it's safe, then yes, and go ahead, I said with a reluctant nod. No need to be so melodramatic. We're still talking about 20 to 40 year old VHS recordings. Orville said as he popped the tape that said, Pity us into the VCR and pressed play. After a few seconds of static, a grainy and desaturated image of a man in a chair appeared on screen. 
The chair was cast from rusted steel and starkly utilitarian in design. While the room he was sitting in was bare concrete as far as we could see. The man was completely bald with a drawn and haggard face. His eyes were a jawed and yellow and his skin was browned like aged paper and it hung loosely off his face, as if he had recently lost an enormous amount of weight. His clothes were ragged and woven from some coarse and faded fabric, and I wondered if he was a political prisoner of some kind. He certainly gave off the impression of being an innocent man who had suffered greatly and unjustly, his eyes begging the viewer for pity. He held his gaze on the camera for a few seconds, looked down at a scrap of paper in his hands and, and then cleared his throat. It wasn't our fault. He spoke in a hoarse voice that just barely managed to be louder than a whisper. They demanded sacrifice. They demanded obedience and we could not resist. All of our strength, of mind and of will and of flesh was sacrificed in their name. And we had become too weak to resist. The need to feed the engines of war has left our world nearly bereft of life. And yet, it was an industry that left us starved and impoverished, beaten and maimed, wasted from disease. That is what was demanded of us, that we feed all the world to the signal until there was nothing left, and never dare to take so much as an extra serving of gruel for ourselves. All that was created went to the cause. We had sacrificed so much, and we have nothing left to sacrifice anymore. We couldn't have defied them even if we had wanted to, and all we wanted was respite from our ordeal. What else could anyone be expected to want? When we were finally no longer of any use, when we had no more to give, they said it was finally our time to be rewarded, and that our reward was to be one of transcendence. They said the signal would help us achieve enlightenment, to help us understand that the ruined world was our reward, that it was better this way, quieter, but it didn't work. The signal twisted them, and now it's twisting us and we can't stop. We hear it now, always, no matter what, and it'll take all it can from us until we are nothing but wretched and forlorn. And even then, it will not be sated. The signal will not be stopped, and it cannot be stopped. Can you hear it yet? Sure enough, I did. I hadn't noticed it before, but there was some sort of signal playing over the man's speech. It was subtle, easy enough to think nothing of at first. But now that my attention had been drawn to it, I found it a very unsettling sort of sound like a theremin but not quite, fluctuating between high and low tones so rapidly it seemed almost random, but some cadence of a pattern was undeniably present. It wasn't music though, more like Morse code, like it was trying to desperately communicate some sort of message that it couldn't risk falling into the wrong hands. Oh no, 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 no. Orville mumbled as he desperately began pressing stop, pause, and eject on the VCR. When the tape continued to play, he knocked the TV to the ground. Before I could ask what the hell had come over him, he picked up his hickory cane and swung it towards the TV to smash it. He never made contact though. The TV was gone. His shop was gone. Our world was gone. Instead, it was just he and I in a desolate, abandoned city. The buildings and infrastructure were all starkly utilitarian in their design, all gray and hard and cold, just like the chair and room the man had been sitting in. Other than Orville and myself, there wasn't a speck of color or a living thing in sight. There was no ambient noise at all. The air was still and yet smelt of an oncoming storm and the lumpy clouds overhead were so motionless, I wouldn't have been surprised to learn that I was looking at a painted ceiling. Son of a... Orville screamed in frustration as he dropped to his knees, striking at the empty space where the TV had been. I, on the other hand, just stood there in stupefied silence. I had never been translocated before and my brain was struggling to comprehend what had just happened. 
Of course, that's what pity us meant. So stupid. Orville cursed himself. Orville, what are you talking about? What's happening and where are we? I managed to ask. He let out a long sigh before turning to look at me with a dismal expression. The realm of the forlorn. He replied grimly. It's a world ravaged by years and decades of escalating psychotronic warfare until there was nobody left to fight. That was a psychotronic signal that you heard. And once it was deep enough into our brains, it pulled us into this reality. Your uncle must have come across it on the retrovision like someone stepping on an old landmine. I stared at him incredulously for a moment, trying to decide whether or not I believed him. The otherworldly hue to the gray light falling on the empty, brutalist buildings all around us pushed me towards the former. You really have visited other realities before, haven't you? I murmured softly as I tried to remember all the crazy stories that I had read about him. Let's just say that I've had some on-the-job experience in a few exotic locales, he said as he pushed himself back onto his feet. Listen up. The most important thing right now is for you to stay calm and do exactly what I tell you. The psychotronic weapons the governments of this world use to torture their enemies and subjugate their own citizens have penetrated deeper and deeper until the very fabric of the reality started to unravel. That's why the signal can leak out into other realities. It's how we got pulled in. And it's also how we can get back. We need to find the weak spot that we fell through and use it to cross back over before we're no longer compatible with our own reality. What the heck does that mean? I demanded. It's not a productive area of conversation at the moment is what it means. Orville snapped back. Give me your phone now. Exasperated, I reached into my pocket and grabbed it, checking the signal strength before handing it to him. I've got no bars, no Wi-Fi, nothing, I explained. That won't matter to who I'm calling, he said, snatching it out of my hand. I swear that the number he punched into was just the number 7 11 times over. But despite that and the absence of anything resembling a cellular network, I heard the phone start to ring. Now oh, come on Gary, don't put me on hold. Owen oh, kid, keep quiet. We don't want to attract any attention to ourselves. Me? You're the one who cursed a bloody murder and attacked the ground the instant that we got here. I reminded him. For a second, he looked like he was going to backtalk me. But then I saw his face twist into a terrified grimace as he realized that I was right. Oh no. He murmured as he began darting his head around in every direction. I didn't know what he was looking for, but I started looking around too, thinking that whatever it was... I'd probably know it when I saw it. Sure enough, I did. Another person had appeared in the distance and was slowly making their way over towards us. If I was judging the distance right, the person looked to be around seven feet tall. They were covered head to toe in a coarse gray fabric without any exposed skin at all. Their face and head covered by a veil and a pointed hood. Their gait was shuffling and their head was hung low, and I wasn't even sure if they were aware of us. Orville, do you see? I started whispering. Cheese it, he shouted, sprinting off towards one of the nearby buildings. There was a mortal fear and desperate urgency in his voice which strongly suggested that I should obey without question, but instead, my gaze was drawn back to the being, slowly making their way towards me. Their body language and the way that they were moving made it seem like they might be hurt or otherwise be in need of assistance. Generating just enough pity in me to stave off my sense of self-preservation for the moment. Uh, hello? Hello, are you alright? I called out cautiously, slowly raising my hand in a greeting. The being tossed back their head and let out an ear-splitting wail. It wasn't an aggressive or predatory call but a forlorn and heart-wrenching sob of abject misery. I reflexively slammed my hands over my ears, but as much as the wail pained and terrified me, I still couldn't will myself to abandon this creature. I almost felt like I was looking at the survivor of a nuclear bomb or something. They weren't a monster, but instead had been disfigured by something monstrous. 
and I even began to weep. I felt such genuine empathy for this person, who had once surely not been so very different from me. But then the wails were joined by a chorus of equally tortured howls from all around us, and more of the strange beings began slowly shambling towards me. That, thankfully, was enough to finally get my fight or flight response into full gear, and I dashed into the building Orville had disappeared into. Orville, I shouted, desperately searching for any sign of him. He didn't reply, but he had left a clear path in the dust and a breeze that littered the floor of the long abandoned and deteriorating building. I raced towards the stairwell that he had used, but the wailing around me became so intense that I stumbled to the ground and clutched my head out of sheer agony. They were in the building now, the forlorn, and their wretched voices echoed off the hard concrete and seemed to be amplified a hundredfold. Worse than the volume, though, was that I can now make out whispered voices amidst the wailing. Can you hear it? The signal and the noise it calls to all. It is subtle, but it is relentless and it must be heard. And bit by bit, it remakes the world until it is omnipresent and unignorable. It took every sense but sound from us. It's in our ears and in our heads and in our voices and in our footsteps. In the rustling of our rags and the creaking of our bones. It is our very heartbeat. It is every sound we hear and every sound that we make. It's everything to us now. It cannot be ignored or denied. It demands service and it demands sacrifice. And we've sacrificed everything that cannot be of service to it. We've sacrificed so much, suffered so much, and yet the signal will never be sated. So long as we conserve it, we must suffer. It will never release us. It is louder than us now. Can you even hear us? If you can, then please, please pity us. I forced myself to look up and saw several of them standing before me, scuttling towards me as quickly as they could manage. One of them screamed louder than the others. The silhouette of a gaunt and gaping face, faintly visible beneath its veil, I watched as it slowly outstretched a trembling arm towards me. It was begging for help. They all were, I was sure of it. They had been suffering in this place for so long and were so desperate, they just gravitated towards any possible hope of salvation. How could they not? How could I deny them that? Slowly, reluctantly, and almost forcibly, I reached out towards the creature. The instant before our hands touched, I heard a hoarse battle cry ring out from behind me and saw a wooden cane strike the creature across the skull, knocking it to the floor. Orville had come back for me. Jeez, it means move, kid, he shouted, grabbing my arm and pulling me up the stairwell. The forlorn plodded up the stairs after us, but their clumsy gates were unable to match our speed. I imagine that wasn't of much concern to them, though. Where were they supposed to go after all? I was just about to voice that concern when I saw that the doorway Orville was pulling me towards was filled with a softly glowing white fog. What is? No time. Orville cut me off before I could even finish asking. Now, I obviously didn't have a lot of time to analyze the situation in any real detail, but with the benefit of hindsight, I can safely say that at that moment, letting Orville drag me through what I could only presume was a portal to God knows where was a slightly less risky option than remaining in the realm of the forlorn, but only slightly. I didn't resist or try to escape, but I did scream as I was pulled through the doorway. Once we were over the threshold, the fog seemed to block all of the noise coming from the other side. There was music though, I think. Cheerful music that definitely wasn't coming from the realm of the forlorn, but it didn't last long enough for me to tell what it was. Orville and I came running out the other side, and the white light had been so bright that all I could see was spots at first. I crashed into a wall, but I heard Orville slam a door shut and shout something into my phone. By the time my vision cleared enough to see again, I realized we were back in Orville's shop. Orville was sitting with his back up against a door, but there was no longer any sign of glowing white fog on the other side. Orville looked exhausted but relieved. 
What did? How did? I stammered. Called in a favor from an old friend, he said, holding up my phone. I heard a man on the other end say something unintelligible, and Orville raised the phone to his ear. What was? No, I don't owe you a favor. I called in a favor. You guys still owed me from last April. No, she didn't pay me for those. Gary, Scrip isn't real money. No, I can't pay my taxes with it. It's not real money. Well, now you're just opening up a whole can of worms about how all the value is ultimately arbitrary. We'll talk about this later. And goodbye and uh, thank you. He pressed and called and deleted the call from my phone's history before handing it back to me. I'm only going to say three more words about what just happened. Don't pity them. He said gruffly as he rose to his feet and ambled him back to his desk. The TV VCR combo was still face up on the floor, but the VHS tape was sticking out of it. Orville bent down and disdainfully pulled it out and tossed it back in the box with the others. So, what will you take for the whole kit and caboodle? I got out of there immediately, leaving my box of VHS tapes with Orville, without taking so much as a cent from him. He mailed me a check though, oddly enough, but I haven't opened it. I'm just glad to be rid of those tapes after what had happened. I wonder how my uncle was able to avoid getting pulled into the realm of the forlorn, or if he didn't, how he got back. He did tell me to never watch the tapes alone, so maybe he had a partner or something in case something like that happened. Maybe the answers are on more of the tapes, but if they are, I'm not brave enough to find them. One near fatal reality slip is enough for me, thank you very much. As terrifying as the entire ordeal was, I don't blame the forlorn one bit. Whether they actually thought that I could help them or if they were just obeying the signal, I don't blame them. I was only under the influence of the signal for less than 20 minutes and I still nearly gave into it. If it hadn't been for Orville, just the sheer good fortune of having watched that tape with someone who knew how to get back home, the fate of the forlorn would have been mine as well. They're innocent victims of the signal and there's no way for me or anyone else to help them. Despite the fact that they tried to trap me there with them, and despite what Orville said, I do pity them. For 85 years, I've tried to keep the world safe. It seems that time may have come to an end. Written by G. Tripp 14 my knees ached as I lowered myself down the worn stone steps. While not an unmanageable task, even at the seasoned age of 107, I dread the descent every morning. Not quite as much as I dread the inevitable return up the stairs at the end of the evening. Musings of having an elevator installed cross my mind daily, but I know that the risk of exposing my work isn't worth it. No sense in hiding these deathly oddities just to have a day laborer unwittingly release a demon back into the world. When I finally had reached the landing at the bottom of the stairs, I propped myself up against a wooden table and drew in a ragged brass. Limited immortality had sounded so much better than this one. I had taken this position so very long ago. No one had bothered to tell me that my body would age and decline and just the same. My tissue paper thin lungs had filled with air again and my pulse was beginning to normalize as I turned my body around to face the squat wooden table on the landing. Directly in the center of the table sat a fist-sized oval made of solid gold and inlaid with a delicate bone filigree. I had always assumed the ornamentation was made from human bone, but I would never know for sure. My predecessor hadn't known either, but such dark objects lead to reasonable assumptions. Shakily, I slid my right index finger into a hole in the golden oval, until I felt a prick of pain as something sharp slipped into my leathery skin. The urge to withdraw my finger from the relic each day was still a struggle to surprise. Pulsing pain radiated into my wrist like arthritis, and I could feel the blood being drawn from my finger. When it stopped, I removed the digit and rubbed the end of it on my thumb. 
I grow tired of the taste of your blood, immortality. Hissed a multi-layered voice from the oval. You will bring me something younger soon, Felix. I demand from a demon trapped in an egg, Zethra. I replied mockingly. I have a bit more work to do before you keep someone else alive for a cursed century. You live so long, I accept your offering of blood. Zethra said angrily. You will not be immortal forever. Oh, quiet egg dweller. I responded as I shuffled down the hallway toward the archives. With an attitude like that, I'm likely to give you a dip into the barrel. Silence. Even the likes of Zethra feared being placed in the barrel. Shuffling footsteps bounced off the rough granite walls of the hallway as I made my way toward the archive. The heavy door glowed lightly with ruins that I had never been able to read. It didn't matter anyhow. My predecessor had shown me the order in which to touch them, to open the door so their meaning had a little significance to me. My throbbing index finger traced a path between the correct ruins, and I heard the latch click and the hinges gave a low groan, and the door opened inward. For the last 85 years, I had been the senior archivist for the historical society of a tiny Midwestern town. We display antique tools, turn-of-the-century documents, and rusted pieces of Americana for board school children to look at and forget during obligatory school field trips. Our genealogy office sees a bit more of an enthusiastic response from the older citizens here. But my real work, however, is found 50 feet down the stone steps, below the historical society and beyond the ruined oak door. There, I am the archivist. It's a fancy title, I know. The archive has been there long before this town ever existed. For all the wonders and terrors held within my organization, they know precious little of the origin of this place. For that matter, we often know little of the objects that we collect other than the power that they possess and the possible implications to the world at large. The objects themselves come in at random intervals. A bed rag old man or woman appears at the historical society desk a few times a year and presents me with a brown paper wrapped box. They tell me that it's a donation for the historical society, then place a copper coin with a crucifix and half moon stamped on it down on my desk. We nod at one another and they depart. These are the Venators, the Relic Hunters. At this point, my work actually begins. I would leave my apprentice, Thomas, to watch the society as I trudge down those dang steps with the new package. As Zethra gets it a daily drink and I receive another day of life in return. This ritual I must perform daily, package or not. I will continue feeding that imp until Thomas is prepared to assume my duties as the archivist. Relics are sorted into two categories upon arrival, archive and termination. Archive relics aren't necessarily banal objects, but they are safe enough to store without causing havoc by their sheer presence. An excellent example of this is found on aisle 3, shelf 4. Carved from Brazilian rosewood and adorned with silver bands, the pen of a Maimon is easily contained. Without a hand to wield it, the thing holds no power. In the hand of the unsuspecting, death is certain. If gripped in a bare hand, the pen will begin to draw blood from the user as ink. Enthralled by the pen, the wielder will be compelled to write every sin and wrongdoing that they have committed over their lifetime. No poor deed is too small to be drawn forth on a crimson lace page. And worse yet, there is no man or woman alive who would run out of evil deeds before they run out of precious ink. And the pen sits in a resin case as it has for many decades. No touch, no trouble. Termination relics are those that simply cannot be contained. Their existence is such that proximity alone can lead to calamity. An unfortunate example of this can be found on aisle 1, shelf 2. Roughly twice the size of a marble, the glass ball is filled with swirls of crimson and obsidian. Trayman's eye. What a terrible thing. 
While unassuming in appearance, too much time in its proximity proves maddening. Spending more than two to three weeks within a 100-foot radius of Trayman's eye will drive anyone to madness and eventually homicidal actions. Though the victim of the eye believes the thoughts to be their own, it is actually the malevolent whispers of the glass sphere. The voice of Trayman will fill your mind with irrational feelings and beliefs about your friends and loved ones until you are driven to take their lives. With all of my years of experience handling cursed objects, Trayman's eye toys even with me. My thoughts in the last few weeks have begun to dwell on believing my assistant Thomas has some dark purpose for the archive. If you're wondering why I've been so careless as to leave it here long enough for these thoughts to invade my mind, I assure you it was not done lightly. I've investigated methods to contain the dark whispers from the sphere to avoid its now obvious and necessary destruction. But sadly, my efforts have been in vain. Draymond's eye will have to enter the barrel. The barrel is the last known Sangri de Cristo, Sanguis Christi for my Latin speaking friends, or for the English inclined it is simply the blood of Christ. Stored in a cask made of Jerusalem pine and banded in braided gold, it is the last of its kind. This is also why we must determine whether or not to destroy an artifact. You see, the barrel is finite, and the process of submerging and destroying these objects consumes the last bits of the precious liquid. So, I began my work. Fortunately for me, my walk was short to the doomed artifact. When I had reached the shelf and looked at the swirling glass sphere, I could already hear the voice that sounds much like my own mind whispering. The boy will destroy everything you've worked so hard for, immortality. A nonsense demon. I'm aware that you know what I am, Felix, yet still, I tell you the boy will be your doom. This can be stopped if you spare me. Anything facing its own destruction would tell the same lies, Tremon. Mask the djinn if you do not believe me. Thomas releases him when you're away. Beware, Felix. I'll take this under consideration, Trayman. Farewell. With this back and forth finished, I pulled the silver tongs from my pocket and used them to grasp the orb on the shelf. I shuffled my feet toward my workbench and placed the sphere on a purple velvet pillow and settled myself on the stool. My knuckles throbbed as I lifted the heavy wooden lid from the barrel nestled in the center of my workbench. A rich aroma of cardamom, myrrh, and copper filled the air as I gently placed the lid to the side. Taking the tongs, I lifted the sphere from the velvet pad and I dropped it into the barrel. I heard the plunk of it as it fell through the thick liquid and settled on the bottom of the cask. Those shrieks and the sound of bubbling filled the room, but I didn't bother to look inside the barrel. I have seen the process enough times that the novelty has worn away. I recovered the barrel and prepared to leave the archive for the day. Tremon was no more and I had grown tired. My eyes drifted toward the brass gin lamp on dial 1 at shelf 4 as the demon's words filled my head. Mess the gin if you did not believe me. Perhaps I would tomorrow. And Trayman's influence had left me but still I worried. Thomas would need to be prepared to take over my position soon. Zethra was right. I wouldn't be immortality forever. When I arrived at the historical society building today, the lights were still off and I became concerned. It was Tuesday and Thomas was generally here in the early hours of the morning warming the building and readying it for our tours. I saw no sign of his car as I slowly made my way up the path toward the door. When I had reached the front, I found the door unlocked and I warily stepped inside. Thomas? I yelled into the darkness. Anyone, hello? No answer returned to me. I turned and locked the door behind me and patted my jacket pocket to be sure that I had something to defend myself with. My weapon was always there, but it comforted me to feel it below my hand. The main floor of the society building was empty. My knees already ached and my chest rose and fell rapidly, just from the energy expended in my initial surge. 
dread filled me for the walk down the stairs to the archive. The descent took me much longer than usual. Bracing myself against the squat wooden table, I closed my eyes tightly and struggled to smooth out my breathing from pants to long, even brass. When I opened my eyes, the first thing I noticed was the absence of Zethra's egg. The table was empty. A table that had been in place for over 200 years and now sat empty. My wavering heart thumped its own weak impression of panic as the finality of the situation had dawned on me. Zethra was gone. For the first time in 85 years, the timer to my demise began to tick away in my mind. Pushing myself away from the table, I made my way down the hall only to see the heavy oak door shredded to splinters and littering the floor. As I crossed through the destroyed barrier, two things immediately stole my attention. Every aisle of the archive was now barren. Not a single shelf held an item. Worse yet, I could see the Jerusalem pine barrel turned on its side. All the crimson liquid spread across the floor, dried and flaking. The only item left of these centuries of collection sat on the edge of my workbench, the gin's lamp. Unable to act of its own agency, it had been stored as an archive relic, but now it alone remained. Warm tears trailed down the deep lines of my face as I forced myself in motion toward the lamp. I rubbed the butt of my palm against these smooth sides and looked at the gray mist that poured from the spout. A translucent and emaciated figure appeared before me and smeared. It wore only a loincloth and golden jewelry. Every bone and joint protruded cartoonishly beneath the tight skin of its body. The pupilless eyes flickered a dull white glow as the thing gazed in my direction. Immortality, the djinn said. Why have you summoned me? Where are the relics, Davine? I asked, anger boiling in my voice. Who has done this? Davine, the djinn, smiled at me, revealing a mouthful of gold capped and jagged incisors. Well, Thomas, he replied simply. I shook my head. No, I replied. Thomas wouldn't have done this. He knows the dangers that lurk here. He has freed us all, Devine replied without emotion. He has taken these wonders and will free them back into the world to do their work. You are at an end, Felix. Thomas has seen to this. Taking Zethra hasn't killed me, I said in return. It has simply put me on a timer. Return to your lamp, Devine. No. It replied with a smile. Devine raised a withered arm in my direction and I began lifting off the ground. At first, the pressure removed from my aching knees was almost a welcome until the pain began. It felt as though a monstrous snake has wrapped it around my body to squeeze the life out of me. He freed me too, you fool, spat the gin. You have no power here anymore. The price for my freedom was to remain here and end the great immortality. I could feel the air being pressed from my lungs. Small sensations like the crackling of dry twigs spread first across my ribcage and then across my entire body. Consciousness was slipping away and my vision was beginning to cloud. And then I realized that the gin's lamp was still hooked on my left index finger. With the last of my strength, I drew the lamp to my chest and shoved my right hand into the pocket of my jacket. Gripping the vial within, I pulled it out and held the vial to my mouth. Biting the cork with my teeth, I pulled it from the vial, and drops of blood from inside splashed out of my face. Not too much of it, I hope. I poured the final precious vial of the blood of Christ out of the crystal tube onto the lamp wrapped around my finger. The metal began to sizzle and melt away into a puddle on the floor below me. Air rushed back into my lungs as the snake-like grip around my body loosened and vanished before dropping me to the ground. As I lay on the ground in a helpless pile, I looked toward Devine. His expression was vacant and his eyes locked onto the area where he had held me in the air only moments ago. Slowly, his body began to wobble in a circle and his jaw fell slack. A cascade of yellow and purple light burst out of his mouth and dissipated into the room. 
and with that, Devine dissolved into nothingness. I'm not sure what I'll do from here, but I'll figure something out. It's not as though I really have any choice in the matter. My apprentice had stolen thousands of cursed objects. If that wayward jinn is to be believed, then these items will be sent back out into the world that I have tried so desperately to keep safe. Beware of strange items. If you receive something valuable that you weren't expecting from a stranger, do not accept it. I don't know where or how these relics will make their way out, but I'm afraid that this mad scheme will be seen through to the end. Should you happen upon one of these demonic vessels, I simply ask you to do the following. Take them to your local historical society. Tell them that it's a donation, but that you lack the coin. Heck, tell them Felix sent you. They'll know what to do. As for me, I'm immortality no more. Zethra got its wish. This warning may be my final act in attempting to help this world. If any Venators are reading this, then I beg you to complete your work. It has never been more important. We are losing this battle, but the world will pay the price. Thank you all for listening and making it all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed and thank you very much to today's podcast sponsors, Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash mrcreeps and get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. And Omaha Steaks. Visit omahasteaks.com and enter Mr. Creeps into the search bar and order the spring grill pack today. You'll save over 50% plus you'll get 4 Omaha Steaks burgers and 4 boneless chicken breasts free with your order. As always, I hope you guys have a wonderful morning, day, or night wherever you may be in the world. And of course, stay creepy.